Hello, viewers. As you know, I enjoy speaking from time to time with those who have escaped abusive cults, particularly those who are Je former Jehovah's Witnesses like me. But today's interview will be a little different. Many of you with a JW background will be aware that the Watchtower leadership routinely suggests that it takes a scholarly approach to understanding the Bible. Well, today, I'm delighted to be interviewing an actual Bible scholar who I'm hoping will help me refine my knowledge of the Bible and view it in its proper context. Robert M. Price has PhDs in both the New Testament and systematic theology. In addition to being founder and editor of the Journal of Higher Criticism, Dr. Price is professor of biblical criticism at the Center for Inquiry Institute. His books include Beyond Born Again, The Widow Traditions in Luke Acts, A Feminist Critical Scrutiny, Deconstructing Jesus, and The Incredible Shrinking Son of Man. Dr. Price, thank you so much for joining me on the John Cedars channel. Well, it, it's great to, to be here in Croatia. Uh, and uh, one, one uh, little correction, I'm no longer with the Center for Inquiry uh, or the Jesus Seminar because both of them, right after the election of Donald Trump, said that uh, they were now going to concentrate on uh, undoing Trump's mischief. And as a Trump fan and voter, I said, look, you, you're not representing me. Uh, nice knowing you. Okay. I, was, I was also uh, on the faculty, such as it was, of the tiny little online school, Johnny Coleman Theological Seminary, and they kicked me out over the same issue. They said I was representing white privilege, and I liked Trump and all this. So that was that. So it's interesting how uh, how uh, thin the veneer of religion can be when the real issues of politics come up. But anyhow, uh, that uh, doesn't matter. Just a fun story to tell. Okay. So uh, I understand your early background was in the fundamentalist Baptist persuasion. And during your career, you have even served as a pastor but as I understand it, uh, you are no longer religious. If I've summarized things correctly, what prompted you to reevaluate your faith? Well, uh, I had, um, oh, back in, I guess, 1977, I was at Gordon Conwell Seminary, an evangelical uh, institution, and I was uh, soaking up the New Testament scholarship there. They had some really excellent people on the faculty. Uh, th an interesting tribe. Uh, they were people like Gordon Fee and uh, uh, Andrew Lincoln and the late great David Scholler, uh, Ramsey Michaels. These guys were real critical scholars, even though they were card-carrying evangelicals, uh, which meant that there were certain places they wouldn't go, but they weren't just hacks like a lot of uh, fundamentalists are. I wouldn't even call these guys fundamentalists fundamentalist. So there was a lot to, to learn there. But uh, I was also at the time re-examining all the apologetics arguments because I had been into that stuff, I guess, uh, all through college reading all the conservative arguments, Jesus must have risen from the dead, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And around this time, I realized that uh, these arguments were just full of holes. So there was, I, I felt like I couldn't, of course, the, the utility of these arguments, if you're an evangelical, is you can use them in witnessing to defend what you're talking about. If you say, oh, wouldn't you like to accept Jesus as your savior? And they say, uh, who's Jesus? Did he even exist? Why should I believe it? Apologetics, the defense of the faith supposedly enabled you to say, no, you, you really should take this seriously because we have eyewitness accounts and all that stuff. Well, uh, I had read John Warwick Montgomery and Josh McDowell and F.F. F. Bruce and others, uh, and uh, I uh, began looking at the other side of it and realized there was a whole other side I had never seen, and that some of the uh, books by critics like Rudolf Bultmann and others that I had been told were just... Uh, agenda-driven nonsense uh, were anything but, and they had a greater grasp of the Bible than the people I had been reading. 
And so I uh, realized this just isn't the way to go. I, I didn't want to chuck religion. I didn't become anti-religious, but I, I gravitated toward Bultmann and Paul Tillich and eventually uh, Friedrich Schleiermacher and others. And um, uh, by the time I... Uh, well, I was out and, and uh, doing campus ministry for a liberal uh, Protestant group for a few years, and I ran across a pastor of a Baptist church that had once been, a local church that had once been the pastorate of Harry Emerson Fosdick, one of the great voices of liberal Protestantism decades ago, and uh, and uh, it had shrunk to just a room full of people by the time I got there, but the pastor was really an amazing deeply thoughtful person, also interested in ministry to the poor and, and just did all sorts of things. They ran a foreign film festival. They had Tolstoy's granddaughter in there for a, uh, a day of uh, on Tolstoy's work. And, and the guy preached from the New Testament and from Kierkegaard. And I still was pretty agnostic about anything supernatural, but I thought, boy, if, if Christianity could be this, uh, it sounds pretty good to me. Uh, and uh, so I went to that church a few years. I then went down to North Carolina, where I now live, uh, and uh, went to the Episcopal Church because I figured, well, I'm not going to get any decent preaching anymore, but I maybe the liturgy would fill that gap, and it did for a few years. But then I went back uh, to New Jersey to assume the pastorate of that church once the pastor I enjoyed so much had moved on. And I pastored there for about six years. And a lot of the people in that church were kind of, oh, what does uh, Bishop Spong call them? Uh, church alumni, uh, that they had gotten disillusioned with the whole thing. At least three of them I can think of were seminary graduates too, that had just uh, kind of fallen into a wasteland of religion until like me, they found this church. And uh, there were a couple of fundamentalists in the church. It was an interesting mix. Uh, but I didn't know what most of them believed one way or the other because it never really came up. I, I, I dealt with uh, moral issues and broader questions of meaning, and I preached from the Bible most of the time, but it wasn't cheerleading for the Bible. It wasn't theology. I, I never found that counseling had anything to do with that either, despite what some say. And uh, so I enjoyed that, but eventually we had a congregational split, and I uh, started uh, with uh, my faction having a Sunday morning meeting in my living room. And um, I did that for about six years, moved back to North Carolina. Well, during the latter part of that period, I had decided I really couldn't be a theist anymore. I had kind of reconciled myself with belief in some sort of an abstractly defined God. But I uh, started reading Don Cupid and uh, Jacques Derrida and Deconstructionist, and I uh, began to think, you know, there's really no reason to believe that there's this... Uh, this uh, kind of uh, abstract uh, parade float up there in the sky, uh, and and I became uh, more or less an atheist. And uh, though I, I still appreciate it a lot about religion, I still love it and find it fascinating. I, I'm not one of these scorched earth uh, God haters and all that stuff, uh, but I found that it meant less and less to me personally, existentially. And uh, so I wind up in an, well, like Paul Tillich said, on the boundary. Uh, I'm, I really feel much at home with uh, people who are skeptics and atheists, though I really find their, their hatred for religion to be distasteful and arid. Uh, I I've, have a lot of friends that are uh, committed, even fundamentalist Christians, traditionalist Catholics. Uh, they know what I think. I know what they think. But what the heck? It shouldn't be a, a barrier, and it isn't. So uh, I, I like, I even love religion, all of them, uh, without believing in them. I guess that was kind of Joseph Campbell's approach also. And uh, so I, I try to, it's easy for me to try to give a fair shake to everybody. I, I'm interested in the truth, at least as a goal. And uh, so I don't play team sports with it like some people do. Hmm. 
Well, it sounds like we have the basis for an interesting conversation mm -hmm. because um, you're a Trump voter. Uh, I'm British, but can't stand Trump. Um, you are basically atheist, but have a soft spot for religion. Mm -hmm. I can't. I'm atheist, but really can't stand religion. Mm -hmm. but, um, nevertheless, it, you know, we can learn a lot from each other. I'm oh, sure. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, as I mentioned before, you are the founder and editor of the Journal of Higher Criticism, but you probably won't be surprised to learn that Jehovah's Witnesses don't tend to write about higher criticism mm -hmm. in a favorable light. Mm -hmm. um, a 1982 Awake said, higher criticism has opened the gates to a flood of pseudo scholarly works whose effect has been to undermine people's confidence in the Bible. And I love this quote from a 1953 Watchtower. The fundamentalists teach pagan doctrines under a Bible label and the modernists babble higher criticism to undermine the scriptures. Atheists are more honest and do the Bible far less harm. The clergy are wolves in sheep's clothing. The atheists are wolves in wolves clothing and everyone knows where they stand. So <laughs> what mm. is higher criticism and why do you think groups like Jehovah's Witnesses are so scornful of it? Well, they're right. It is destructive of the kind of fundamentalist, literalist approach that they and their uh, competitors share. Uh, they have a kind of an, an intra uh, fundamentalist debate going on. Uh, they have basically the same ground rules, but uh, given the Bible's ambiguity uh, on many points, they don't agree any more than Baptists and Presbyterians do on a different set of issues. Uh, whereas the higher criticism is uh, a fundamental challenge to that whole way of looking at the Bible. The term higher criticism was one of a pair. They used to speak of lower criticism, which referred to textual criticism. Now, some people are, are uh, mortified by that, even uh, people that uh, I think for psychological reasons view the Bible as a kind of a security blanket. And uh, the Bible they're talking about is the one they read when they were a kid, and especially the King James Version, though that's less and less true with the proliferation of modern translations. But they began, like some, some will even say that uh, the King James is better as a source of spirituality with its archaic language, which was archaic even when it was translated, uh, because uh, it makes you really work for it. Well, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's kind of beside the point. Uh, and uh, they don't like the idea that, as lower critics say, uh, that there's like about a oh, a page and a half of extra text in the King James New Testament. Uh, various things have been added, large and small. And uh, they say, wait a minute, what do you mean the snake handling thing or the woman taken in adultery are not in the original text? What do you mean that, that you are in a position to say that something in my Bible was not in the original? Where is that going to stop? Well, there were fun devout fundamentalist textual critics that looked at it a different way and said, now, now, wait a minute, these, uh, you got to know enough about the Bible's history to realize that what we're reading, even in the King James, is a result of people looking at a whole bunch of ancient manuscripts, which differed at many points. I mean, you, you can't deny that, uh, even as a great fan of the Bible. So uh, these, these, uh, I think um, Constantine Tischendorf and, and others uh, were Orthodox Christians, but they said, hey, we believe the Bible is the verbally inspired word of God, but that gives us all the more reason to make sure we know which words were in the original. We, we don't yeah. want to be reading brand X in there. If you buy and, into and, the idea that there really is at some point in history an unalterable word of God that found its way onto the page, you're going to want to know how to get to it or, yeah. or whether the text that you have has deviated from it in any way. 
That's right. I mean, and think of stuff like the snake handling business in Mark 16. Uh, there are churches still where this is practiced every Sunday. I watched a Vice documentary on that where they, mm. they were, visited a church where they, where they were doing snake handling. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that uh, admittedly, that's a kind of a weird example, but a good one because it shows you that can cost you your, your neglect of textual criticism can be literally fatal, yeah. uh, strange. So these themselves were devout Orthodox evangelical Christians. So lower criticism wasn't threatening to everybody who was, a, let's say, a biblicist, but the higher criticism, and I don't know why they picked those metaphors, but the higher criticism said, well, that's good stuff, but but you can go further and ask if the Bible was written by the, the names that appear in published editions of the Bible. Uh, did Moses really write the Pentateuch? Uh, did, did Paul really write the letter to the Hebrews or, or all of the letters that do have his name on them? If Moses uh, did write the Pentateuch, it was quite a feat because he dies in it as well, doesn't he? Yeah. So. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's it's funny to me how uh, the people that uh, argue for mosaic authorship will say, okay, okay, he didn't write that. Maybe Joshua added it. Uh, right. Wait a minute. You're letting the camel's nose under the tent flap. Yeah. You're admitting yeah. that there may be other writers, more than one writer. And, yeah. uh, of course, there's just loads of uh, evidence that uh, Moses couldn't have written it. Now the issue is what century or what millennium was it mm. written in? Uh, was It may be a, much younger than we thought, but to even raise questions like that or um similarly did the things recounted there ever really happen were some of them or all of them possibly myths and legends and if they were what difference does it make uh are there contradictory teachings uh, and and contradictory versions of events well, if there are, you've really got to rethink what you mean by the inspiration and authority of the Bible, because if a, a notion like a teaching on divorce, let's say, uh, is, uh, is, it differs in two different places in the Bible, either one of them would have authority simply by virtue of the fact that it's in Scripture. But if you have two in Scripture that contradict each other, you're up the creek. Uh, not only does that leave you like a, the proverbial donkey hesitating between the two haystacks, uh, it, uh, it also means that um, just because something appears in the text of Scripture does not mean it's authoritative, because these both can't be true at the same time. And uh, usually what they do is to say, well, uh, really, there's no problem. Uh, you have to interpret Scripture by Scripture, and you have to uh, interpret the less clear by the more clear. And of course, that's just euphemism for saying you have to uh, interpret the ones you like, uh, the ones you don't like by the ones you like uh, pretend that they mean the same thing if you could Which is basically it, cherry picking isn't it yeah yeah it's uh it's uh, harmonizing and uh, mm. it's uh well, i think uh, walter kaufman called it gerrymandering the bible carving it up to make it look like it says what you like or what has your the tradition of your church says and uh, that's just dishonest and doesn't work because the, the basic Protestant approach to the Bible is that uh, you have to go by the plain sense of the text. Martin Luther was very clear on that because he rightly saw that if you could say there are deeper levels attainable only by allegorizing the text, well, you're just making the Bible into a ventriloquist dummy. Whether you're uh, Edgar Bergen with the Bible as Charlie McCarthy, whether you're Edgar Bergen or the Pope is, it doesn't matter. You don't even really need the Bible. It's, it's just a figurehead. And uh, look what they're doing when they say, well, text B does sound kind of bad, but uh, if you look at it this way, you can harmonize with text A. You're saying that the plain sense is not normative. You're free to go find something else. It's just an incoherent mess. Mm -hmm. And that's why the Jehovah's Witnesses, like all fundamentalists, are quite right. If you introduce this element of doubt, namely 
scholarly scrutiny, uh, you're touching the ark. You are destroying the, the basis of biblicism. Now, they say, well, that's uh, uh, because you hate the Bible and you hate God. No, no, it doesn't have anything to do with that. It was devout Protestants and Catholics that uh, founded the higher criticism. But again, I think the, the fundamentalists are right because look what happens when you say I do I am a Christian I uh, hold the Bible as an authority well, well, how about those contradictions well you see I guess we have to say now that God inspired these people to record a range of opinions well uh, that or you what about all the legends and stuff Noah's flood come on it can't have happened well that's all right but who's to say God does not inspire legends and fictions that are edifying Jesus told parables why not yeah that's quite reasonable but the thing is inspiration comes to mean less and less mm. until finally it's it means nothing at all yeah as Francis Schaeffer used to say a great fundamentalist apologist it's become a mere connotation word. Uh, you can't say that the Bible is to be heeded more than uh, anything else uh, at that point. So yeah, the witnesses are right. This really does destroy the Bible as an authoritative scripture, but you have to put away childish things, unfortunately, and they're not willing to do it. Indeed. Well, we can agree there. Um, so um, what would you say are the most common misconceptions about the Bible? that it is inerrant, there are no mistakes in it, that's certainly not the case, uh, that uh, all of the authors of it um, agreed with one another wherever they touched the same issues, that uh, the Bible is centuries older than it probably actually is, that, um, that the Bible is the source of all authority when in fact the Bible was, uh, the books were chosen and edited by the church. Roman Catholics don't have a problem with that, but Protestants with sola scriptura do. For the Bible to be what they want it to be, it would have to have like fallen out of the sky, maybe down the chimney as a finished book, but that's just not the case. Uh, the, uh, the another misconception is that textual criticism has done its work. We we now have uh, almost absolute certainty as what as to what was originally written, and where we don't have certainty, it really doesn't matter. It's a a word is spelled differently here from there. Uh, it's it's not quite that uh, simple, and uh, plus the fact that we don't have copies from the crucial period in which textual fiddling would have been easiest and most desirable to do. We don't know why. I mean, it you're may... saying we have no way of knowing whether the Bible, even after centuries of study and scholarship, is anything close to what was originally intended. Yeah, I wouldn't say anything close, but there is disturbing... Uh, uh, mystery to it in that, uh, like, I, I think people are, well, another misconception is, by the way, that that the Bible has been translated so many times that we've probably lost the original meaning. That's really not so. I mean, right. we, we have ancient manuscripts of different language versions. You don't need to worry about that. Uh, the problem is that it's it's pretty obvious from reading any book of the Bible that it's in a finished form. It's been edited and so forth. And sometimes there are loose ends that make it pretty clear that there were earlier versions that we have no manuscript evidence for. We can pretty much surmise that certain, like we Mark 16, the snake handling, poison drinking thing, we do have manuscripts that are early that lack that. So there's real evidence for that. But there there are a lot of things where it kind of looks like, you know, this would make a lot more sense if this passage had been added because it seems to interrupt the flow of the argument. But uh, these changes would have been made so early that we just don't have manuscripts pro or con. So yeah, we don't know exactly. And the, the omissions or additions are sometimes uh, important, like the role of women in church. Uh, the, this incredible statement in uh, 
1 Corinthians 14 that women are to keep silence in church, and if they want to know anything, let them Your ask. Witnesses husband. take that very literally, by the way. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and, and whoever put that in there wanted them to, yeah. but it doesn't seem like it could be original because a few chapters earlier, it's very clear that women can prophesy in church. Right. You know, what, what was this written by a multiple personality? Uh, is, is something he changes mind halfway through the it, It's just ridiculous. And so, you know, something funny has gone on. So what were the originals? We, we don't even know that. Um, uh, so there's there's a, another one um, some skeptics uh, think and promote that is wrong is that at the Council of Nicaea the books of the New Testament were chosen. Uh, that's a, that's not true. That uh, that issue was not on the table. Uh, and a few years later, Saint Athanasius, who was one of the big contestants in the debates at Nicaea sent out an encyclical letter saying, okay, for the New Testament, we're gonna use only these 27 books, none of the rest of them that are floating around. But that wasn't at the council, and apparently he was just endorsing an earlier edition from the middle of the second century. So uh, there is a more left-wing critical phantom. Uh, Bible scholars know it's not true, but uh, there's this popular level of pseudo-scholarship. Uh, or when, when people say, you know, the Bible used to teach reincarnation, but it got censored. Uh, no, there were early Christians that believed in it, but we, we have separate writings with that, like the Nag Hammadi Gnostic text. Yeah, there, uh, you could say that, well, the books that taught reincarnation were not finally included in the Bible, if that's what you mean. But they seem to be saying, uh, uh oh, reincarnation, let's, uh, let's redact this with the black lines. That, that's not true. Indeed. Now, um, in his book, The Bible for Grown-Ups, the late Simon Loveday writes, paradoxically, we know more about those who wrote the Old Testament than we do about those who wrote the New Testament. Would you concur with that statement? Uh, I think they're both really... Um and completely anonymous and pseudonymous works. I don't think right. we have really any idea who, uh, sometimes you can tell, well, this, this author must have been one of the temple priests, or this one must have been a scribe, uh, and, and things like that. And same in the New Testament, Matthew, whoever he was, was obviously a Jewish scribe of certain things he says, and the way he treats the text make, make it clear. Whereas the Paul- But it wasn't Pist Matthew. Matthew was just a, a name that was assigned to it. it was yeah. yeah, and it can't have been originally. It's not like we just can't prove that it wasn't Matthew, the tax collector disciple. If you look at Matthew closely, uh, he has he's taken a passage out of Mark where Levi, the tax collector, uh, becomes a disciple, but he's not mentioned in Mark's list of the 12, whereas somebody named Matthew is, and nothing is said about Matthew in Mark, nothing about Matthew, the tax collector. Well, then you, you turn over to Matthew, who uses Mark, he has not Levi, but Matthew, the tax collector, become a disciple. And then when you get to the list of the 12, he's added Matthew, the tax collector. You wouldn't have this if Matthew was writing his own story. He's cobbling together a mini autobiography from somebody else's life. Come on. And there's just all kinds of problems with that. We just don't know. And the, the, the names were all later editorial guesswork anyway. Tell, tell me about the, because uh, this is one thing that I was presented to me when I was a believing Jehovah's Witness. I called on someone's house and he, he was um, basically an atheist, uh, but he was fascinated by the Bible and religion. Mm -hmm. And he showed me the thing about Alma um, and the, the issue of uh, Jesus being born of a virgin and the fact that that mm -hmm. came from a mistranslation. What can you tell us about that? Well, that's a little more complicated because it, it there's reason to believe that, you know how words change their meaning and usage. The Dead Sea Scrolls um, 
quote Isaiah 7, 14, behold, the Alma shall conceive, and they take it to mean virgin, but they don't believe there was the teacher of righteousness or whoever was literally virgin born. Uh, they're, uh, they're, they're using uh, Alma to refer to the, the community of Israel. Uh, and uh, the thing is, there's... Uh, but this doesn't re- Alma mean woman, and there was actually a word for virgin that they could have yeah. used? But the the thing is, it it looks like uh, you can tell I'm having trouble thinking today. Uh, <laughs> it, it appears that that by the time I think uh, Jane Shaberg pointed this out in her book, The Illegitimacy of Jesus, a mm. book that got her car filled with uh, shotgun uh, uh, holes, uh, that uh, that uh, by the time the word Parthenos, Greek for virgin was used in Matthew, Parthenos apparently had, in Greek, had uh, reached the same state of ambiguity as Alma had, where it could mean intact virgin or uh, woman of marriageable age. Mm. So you can't exactly tell. And in fact, uh, it's not clear even from the rest of the narrative of either Matthew or Luke that either evangelist was saying Jesus was miraculously conceived of a virgin. Uh, And uh, she has a pretty effective argument, but the word uh, Alma could mean either one. Eventually, apparently the word uh, uh, Ketuba, I think it is, uh, may have loosened up. And the same thing may be true of Parthenos. Like, why did the Jewish translators of the Old Testament the, the, into Greek, the Septuagint, why did they translate it in Isaiah 7:14 as Parthenos? Because Matthew is quoting the Greek Septuagint. Uh, they didn't believe anybody was virgin born. The, the word must already have become more ambiguous by then. It was Jews that did this translation. So uh, there's uh, the, the person had a, a point, but in further lexical. Um, research has shown that it it was already kind of murky. The same thing has happened in the New Testament with the word uh, friendship, love, kiss, and have sex with. Uh, There was, since one word kept uh, shading off into the other, uh, they would move to another word. Uh, Agape became uh, the word for love once phileo had become ambiguous in meaning. Uh, the word kiss became a, a euphemism for intercourse. And so they'd use another word for it. And the slippage, as Derrida says, the slippage along the chain of signifiers. Uh, and so it's it's just sort of a mess there. You have a, trouble determining what's meant in some rare cases. So do you subscribe to the view that this is the impression I get from what I've read so far, that basically whoever was writing the gospel, particularly the gospel of Matthew, was basically almost like had a checklist in front of him of prophecies that Jesus had to fulfill and was basically making the character of Jesus fulfill them fulfill them one by one, even though it required, for example, um, Mary and Joseph to go on this crazy trip to Egypt um, in the events leading up to his birth. Do you subscribe to the idea that they would they were just kind of trying to check boxes to fulfill all these prophecies? Uh, yes, though I think it's a little bit more complicated in that that uh, like what what you're saying is is different from what is often said that they came up with proof texts to match things they believed Jesus had done. Mm -hmm. What you're saying, I think, is probably closer to the truth. Uh, What I just said makes sense, too. But you're suggesting, like, for instance, that's the only way to take uh, when he says, uh, this happened to fulfill prophecy out of Egypt, I have called my son, Hosea 11.1. When you're actually saying in the text, he did this to fulfill this prophecy, it's almost like you're giving away the fact that you're trying to make him fulfill all these prophecies. Yeah, though the pro- the the problem is nobody reading Hosea one and eleven one, including the evangelist Matthew, would have.
have thought on the surface that this was a prediction of anything because the, it's unavoidably clear in Hosea that this is a reference to God bringing the Israelites, his, his son, out of Egypt, uh, out of Egyptian slavery. Uh, and so uh, he, nobody would have thought that was a messianic prophecy. So why pick on that? I think you have to add the consideration that they were looking for what had become key words for them. If you had Bible passages that had phrases like my son or that day or he will raise us up, uh, you began to say, hmm, I wonder if that's telling us what what Jesus, now that we believe there was one, uh, what he did. And so they. this is much like the Kabbalah today and for centuries past. It was an esoteric meaning they wrung out of the text that seemed to them to tell a story that must have happened. So it's uh, there were some that like the thing with the behold uh, your Jerusalem your king comes to you mounted on the uh, donkey the foal of an ass and all that. You could take that as a, a prophecy of a future coming king, and and it was, and so that's applied to Jesus. But some of them are even less plausible than that because they're looking for esoteric meanings, the very thing Martin Luther was trying to stop. <laughs> so in terms of the bible as a as a historical text i mean th let's face it that's how fundamentalists like jehovah's witnesses view it mm. um jehovah's witnesses even publish like a timeline of, of the years when certain things happened if you if you look at the kind of historical narrative in the bible um how much of it would would you say kind of as a percentage is is real or probably did happen and how much of it do you think is is made up or spurious i think the only part that has any substantial historical basis is the least interesting part of uh, the later monarchies of israel and judah there was a, a dynasty of amri for instance in, in northern israel but uh, even the stuff leading up to that, the idea that there was a united kingdom of Israel and Judah that that, and that, that broke apart, archaeology kind of debunks that. Uh, there, were no, uh, there was no united group. There were two different, different groups, and probably Judah was not even a state until a long time after uh, Israel was. It was more of a distribution network for, for olive growers, as hot as it sounds, uh, their archaeological stuff shows that. So uh, you, you uh, really, I think, only have any history as of on the eve of the uh, Assyrian and Babylonian exiles, and even that is kind of distorted. Uh, the, the, the centrality of the Babylonian exile appears to be a kind of a concentration and enlargement of the general diaspora of Jews throughout the Mediterranean, even back then. So there, there's, uh, there's late uh, material in there that probably had a foundation in history, but uh, the stuff that sounds plausible before that, that is not overtly supernatural and miraculous, even that stuff has grown in the telling, as you can l tell by comparing the earlier version of events in Samuel and Kings with the rewrites in Chronicles, where stories are, are expanding and being corrected and all of that. Who knows how it uh, read before? So I think there's very little, and with the New Testament, I don't know that there's any at all. Uh, it is That seems a little odder because that's the more recent work, but so much of it appears to be just uh, myth-mongering propaganda. Uh, and I don't mean anything uh, insidious or nefarious about that. It's just the same thing happened in Buddhism and Islam. The way um, proverbs and maxims and illustrative stories grow without any real interest in being historical. Centuries later, people think, well, it's in narrative form. I guess it must have happened. But I mean, I, I'm a big fan of uh, Robert E. Howard and H.P. Lovecraft. They wrote narratives, but that doesn't make me think Conan of Sumeria actually exists 
interested because I know there's a difference. And uh, uh, they, uh, in the ancient world, they didn't necessarily. So can I, can I just back up? You said something very interesting there, and I'm trying to process what my thinking is as you're saying it. Um, I understand that there are a number of people who suggest that there was no Jesus and, and even put forward the theory uh, that it, Jesus is an invention, perhaps, of the Romans. Hmm. Um, do you subscribe to any of that? Do you think that there actually was any person at all identifiable as Jesus at any point in history? I don't think there was. I, there's no way to know in the present state of the evidence, but it seems to me the burden of proof is on those who would say there was a historical Jesus, because the, the evidence, again, it's it's like all, it virtually all fits uh, the uh, mythic hero archetype that uh, Lord Raglan and, and others have pointed out, uh, and uh, all these typical stories of the wunderkind and the redeemer and the miracle worker and all that. And I know stories like that can eventually attach themselves like barnacles on the hull of history and biography. So there could be a, a real person at the heart of it, but if so, um, he's just been subsumed by legend and the very, like Caesar Augustus, such stories were told about him, but that's not the bulk of what history tells us about Caesar Augustus. He's woven intricately into the history of his times. Uh, mm -hmm. Whereas that's not true with Jesus. There, there are like four historical characters that he's associated with five. If you want to count John the Baptist, but he's somewhat problematical, but I'm thinking of Herod the, the King, Herod the Great, uh, and then his son Herod Antipas, and uh, Pontius Pilate, and um, Caiaphas, the, the high priest. These guys certainly existed, and for the same reason we know about uh, Augustus. There's various types of documentation and their role in history. Every one of these connections has been pretty much severed by historians who never thought of mythicism. They, they never meant to deny that Jesus existed, but they, they realized, wait a minute, the way Pilate is described here as being a coward, bullied by a bunch of nameless uh, roustabouts uh, down below his palace window. We're going to ride on you to Caesar. Oh, oh, I can't have that. Tell you what, this guy is innocent, but to, uh, to uh, satisfy you, I'll have him condemned. And this guy, who actually is a killer of Romans in an insurrection, will let him go. That's not going to get you in trouble with Rome. That's just absurd. Uh, the, uh, the idea with Herod the Great, was he a paranoid, bloodthirsty maniac? Well, yeah, we got plenty of evidence in Josephus and Philo about that. Strangely, it doesn't mention this atrocity of uh, killing all the babies in a town. Uh, that's just the kind of thing they love to tell about him. Uh, and, and the story is so much like Josephus's retelling of the nativity of Moses in, uh, in Exodus that y you just have to think, well, this one, he... Uh, Matthew or whoever thought that uh, this would be in character. We need a new Pharaoh because Jesus is a new Moses. I'd say King Herod fits the bill. I mean, it's possible it happened, but there's such serious reason to doubt it. Caiaphas, is Caiaphas the high priest, the Pope of, of the Jews? Is he liable to skip the Passover Seder to go uh, preside at this trial before Jesus? What's the rush? I mean, there, there's no way. It's, it's like the person that wrote the story didn't really understand the situation. And, and there are other things like that. Uh, and the, uh, the person that wrote the cleansing of the temple story. Yeah, sorry, just to go back on Caiaphas, I, I think I'm right in saying that when the Sanhedrin met to condemn Jesus, they wouldn't have been meeting because it was the night before the Passover yeah. or something. Yeah, and, and there's no rush. They didn't have yeah. to do that. Yeah. In fact, earlier in the story, they said, hey, let's not even arrest this guy during Passover because he's so popular, they'll be rioting. Uh, yeah. So there wasn't any rush. And 
it, it's just it's just absurd and it, it, maybe somebody could come up with some sort of clever rationalization but if you do that you're already admitting it's not good evidence you're mm -hmm. trying to say well somehow maybe this could still be possible that really doesn't count as historical evidence so I guess if I have my Jehovah's Witness head on, <laughs> I reach into my kind of believer Lloyd, I'm, I'm going to counter what you've just said by saying, well, um, what would be the reason to make up such a story? And also, um, people died for it. You know, Christian, there's accounts of Christians martyring themselves. So why would they die for something that wasn't true? So, well, of course, they thought it was, right. but in terms of the eyewitnesses, if there were such, especially the disciples, we we have no idea what happened to these guys. Even mm -hmm. the one that seems uh, most uh, believable, the beheading of Paul uh, and, and Peter by Nero, this comes from... Um, second and third century apocryphal books of Acts, the Acts of Peter, the Acts of Paul, of John, uh, Thomas, Andrew, and so on. These are just tissues of wild legends that nobody takes seriously in any other respect, but they do have Paul and Peter beheaded. The so-called First Clement, an epistle that some date in around 60 or so AD, but is anonymous actually, and, and may come from decades after that. It says that Paul and Peter gave testimony or were martyrs, because martyr means the same thing as either a, a witness or someone who was killed for his, his, the witness he's given. They gave the ultimate testimony or witness uh, in due to... Um, jealousy whose well that seems to me to to hark back to the apocryphal acts where the apostles are preachers of the celibacy gospel and are pointedly depicted as alienating uh women converts to christ from their pagan husbands who are pretty steamed about this and happen to be highly enough placed to get the king or the governor or whatever to imprison this guy who's alienated their wives from them and that's why they're martyred jealousy led to their martyrdom to me it all boils down to these absurd legends that that no one thinks are accurate in any other respect we don't know what happened to them and and for most of them we don't even have legends so the people we do know that got killed for their faith were no longer in any position to know what had actually happened they simply knew the stories they were they were told in church so, so talk us through what you what you imagine to be the mindset of the writers and i'm not just talking about the new testament i'm talking about the old testament as well because i think was it king josiah there was a story of them finding the original book of the law covenant um and there's some suggestion that rather than just finding it they mm. actually wrote the thing you know mm. around that time um talk us through what you think would have been the mindset was it was it like because the way i try and frame this is the the book of mormon and joseph smith mm. writing down this entirely spurious book purely to garner a following were these were the Bible writers deliberately trying to mislead people for selfish purposes, or were they writing? Were they like the George Lucas of their day, writing an, a nice story that they, that they hoped would inspire people? Well, it's again, it's complicated in that some of the stories, let's say about Jesus or Elijah or King David may have been popular accounts, uh, legends and so on that, that by the time they were written down, people really did assume were true. That, that's possible. But on the whole, the compilation of all this stuff and the writing from square one of a whole lot of it, I think was, uh, not an attempt to deceive or an attempt to write history, but rather to have a kind of an official story that would be edifying and instructive. Like that's so obviously true in the so-called Deuteronomic history, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings, where it's it's just 
you can't miss the idea. Here's God's covenant with Israel. If you if you uh, keep up your end of it, there'll be prosperity and victory. But if you renege and start worshiping idols, there's going to be hell to pay. It's like the old army films. Men, don't let this happen to you. Uh, and it's obvious that's what it's for. And it's equally the obvious. public service announcement. Yeah. 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 yeah they're, I mean, they're not really trying to lie to anybody. Hey, boy, it's going to be great if we can get people to believe that uh, God sent pagans to crush us because we started worshiping. No, it was just that they, they wanted, uh, an, uh, Plato talks about this, having an official statement that will give ideals and warnings to the people. And he, he wasn't talking about uh, historical evidence. And uh, in the Gospels, it says uh, Jesus did many other things that aren't recorded here, but I have recorded these so that you may believe that he's the, the Christ, the Son of God and all that. It's like, it seems to me, it's it's not being sneaky or deceptive. They, like when, one of my favorite little examples um, that's instructive, Mark has, uh, Jesus asked if if divorce is allowable for, for any circumstance, which was a thing between the houses of Hillel and Shammai among the scribes. And uh, he says, well, this wasn't God's plan originally, um, but for the hardness of your hearts, Moses allowed for divorce. Uh, and uh, whoever uh, puts away his wife for any cause forces her into a adultery because uh, as far as God's concerned, they're still married, but what's she going to do? Well, uh, Matthew reproduces this verbatim, except he says, anyone who puts away his wife for any cause uh, – May epi pornea, except for immorality. It's another one of those vague words. Uh, adultery, that's a different word, moikia, which he uses elsewhere. It, now, what was, was Matthew lying to his readers, saying, I bet I can get him to believe that Jesus said more on the topic? No, no, he, he recognizes Mark's uh, gospel already as a kind of a constitutional do document for his churches and things he thinks Jesus and Mark was uh, forbidding divorce. I don't think he was, but that's the way it's always been taken. Uh, but that isn't working. There's some marriages you can't save. So let's take this phrase from Deuteronomy, except for uh, immorality and restore that uh, proviso to it. He was just amending an authoritative text. He wasn't trying to get you to believe something false about what Jesus said or didn't say. And I think that's the, uh, in early Islam, um, some Muslim tradition critics, and they had them even then, they said that uh, a holy man is nowhere so inclined to falsehood than in the matter of hadith, the traditional sayings of the prophet, because they figured anything that's edifying or instructive uh, might as well have been said by the prophet, so let's say it was. And, and it was, go ahead. I was just thinking, because you mentioned earlier about the uh, books, the um, apocryphal books from the second or third century that talked about Peter and Paul being uh, beheaded in Rome. And you, you were saying, you know, that there's absolutely no basis for believing this. But talk us, talk us through the mindset of someone who writes that that happened, that literally just kind of invents this narrative. To me, what they're doing is they're trying to make a dime. That, that uh, That's the only way I can imagine it. They've created this story and they're hoping that if it gets enough traction, they'll maybe profit from it in some way. Is there no element of that in the New Testament? Well, that seems to me anachronistic because of the nature of publishing back then. Right. I don't know that you, th these things, by the way, I'm, I misspoke. Peter was supposed to have been crucified. Under right, okay. Paul beheaded. Uh, but uh, I don't think, like you had, like Luke, uh, if, if Theophilus is supposed to be his patron, that's a typical example of how you had to get a rich person to pay for the copying of your book to circulate any copies of it for libraries and, and occasional bookstalls. But most people wouldn't have had their own uh, books. And these things were written probably by scribes for scribes. And in the New Testament, case, this would have been before Christianity was legitimated by Constantine. Uh, so I, I don't know that anybody would have uh, really 
had any chance to get rich off of this. So why why make up a story about Peter and Paul meeting their demise in Rome? What's is it just to inspire people? Well. It could be that that just grew up as a legend. Like, I wonder how these great apostles died. It must have been martyrdom. Yeah. Uh, that wouldn't be surprising at all. Uh, but um, with, uh, with the case of Rome, this may not be exceptional. But th the idea that uh, they were in Rome at all uh, means they were preaching to converts in Rome. And sure enough, that's the way those acts say it. If they had the glorious martyrdom there, that means that the crown of their teaching, their final words were given to those of us in Rome, and we should have more clout over all the other churches. And that's probably why all the different churches said, well, we were founded by the Apostle Andrew. Or other churches said, like Antioch, well, Peter founded our church too, you know. And it may be that after that, the Roman church said, well, Peter and Paul for us. Us, so we're, we're even better because we know there was this kind of jockeying among major church centers in the second century. And sure enough, the apocryphal acts tell you where they got martyred. And apparently it's all claims of, uh, of clout for uh, authority because they used to argue like the East said Easter should be celebrated on so-and-so day. And the Western churches said, no, 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 we want to celebrate it this way. Hey, look, Paul and Peter taught us, you, you better uh, fall in line. Indeed. Fascinating. I, I just love trying to delve into what motivated some of these things to happen. That's now, historical thinking, yeah. Exactly. Now, um, I want to ask you about the New World Translation. Um, mm. A 1991 Watchtower had this to say about the New World Translation. In fact, the New World Translation is a scholarly work. In 1989, Professor Benjamin Kadar of Israel said, in my linguistic research in connection with the Hebrew Bible and translations, I often refer to the English edition of what is known as the New World Translation. In so doing, I find my feeling repeatedly confirmed that this work reflects an honest endeavor to achieve an understanding of the text that is as accurate as possible. So as a Bible scholar, how do you rate the New World Translation in terms of accuracy? Well, I can only talk about the uh, New Testament. I don't know Hebrew. Right. I don't pretend to. But I, I think it, it is a, a good, a responsible translation. Even the thing that uh, uh, non-witness fundamentalists scream about in John 1.1, 1, 1, the word was a God. That's perfectly legitimate uh, because of this grammatical oddity of uh, how you do not need a definite article for a thing that by your intention would ordinarily have one if the thing is a predicate nominative. Like if you say uh, uh, the word was with God, that's going to have hotheos, with the God. You wouldn't translate it in, in English, but yeah, capital G, God. But if you say uh, the word was God, that uh, the God is not the object uh, of the, the sentence. It's uh, one is the other. So God is a predicate nominative. And uh, it you could have the definite article, but even if you meant the one and only God, you could just skip it as was often done. But uh, you don't know if that's what the author said. And the absence of a definite article is the same as us using an indefinite article, which they didn't have. And the New World Translation says, was a God. That's perfectly legitimate. We just don't really know from the context. Uh, you've surprised me, I, because obviously I, I understand that you're a scholar and you're not going to let your personal kind of background colour your work. But obviously, um, Jehovah's Witnesses get a lot of flack for being non-Trinitarian. You've come from a Trinitarian background mm. and you're apparently leaping to their defence on this. So, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's I don't think you can like the you have intimations of of a trinity uh, at least the the seed from which it grew in the gospel of John th that's true and there are places in my translation the pre Nicene New Testament where I, I like when uh, Jesus said says uh, I came from God 
uh, I think in the context, he means I emerged from the Godhead. So I think there are passages, or like Thomas, my Lord and my God, that seems to me to be deifying Jesus, or I and my Father are one, or have I been with you so long, Philip, and still you don't recognize me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. That's not even Trinitarianism, that's modalism or patropassianism. Jesus is the Father. Like there's, it's, there's no consistent view, but mm. um, there, there are ideas that will get people thinking in the direction of Trinitarianism, modalism, tritheism, but it's not clear. So there were many theories and it took them a long time to come up with Trinitarianism. So yeah. you can't say it's taught in the New Testament, but uh, it's it's just ambiguous and they're well within, the, I mean, like the thing with uh, the, the Logos being the mediator of creation, you find that in Proverbs, you find that in the Wisdom of Solomon, uh, in the book of Sirach, and there it's, it's most clear in the book of Proverbs that uh, wisdom or the, the, the Logos, Sophia Logos, wisdom word, uh, that it, it is a created entity through which everything else is created. And John 1 sounds so much like that, that, uh, yeah, it's entirely legitimate. You can't be sure, but uh, they're, they're by no means twisting the text. And there's several other places. Interesting book by uh, Jason Bedune, uh, called Truth in Translation, where he compares a bunch of contested passages in several different translations, and the New World Translation is one of them. In almost every case, he says, they've got it right, they're not cheating. Uh, and that when uh, Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am, oh, he's making himself, uh, I am that I am. No, no, Badoon shows this is grossly mistranslated by all these people and grammatically explains how it must be translated uh, that uh, I existed before Abraham. Of course, that's still a tall claim, but it, it doesn't, like it's not like homo usios. And mm. so I've found, uh, I think, their translations and often their interpretations are probably closer, like Christ the firstborn of creation. Uh, there's no way to wiggle out of that, though people try to, and often I think the witnesses have it right. That's fascinating. I, I, I obviously don't have a horse in this now that I'm atheist, mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm e I can easily fall on either the Trinitarian or non-Trinitarian mm -hmm. side, but I think I would concur with what you say that there's ambiguity and when there's mm -hmm. room for ambiguity you can basically decide for yourself <laughs> which mm -hmm. which is true and which isn't true now uh, before you came on uh, I asked you to take a look at um, some footage that's been just released by Watchtower literally in the last few days it's the JW broadcasting episode for October and I'm just going to show the viewers a mm. few moments just mm -hmm. to, so that they can understand it it's important to note that the divine name is consistently used in fragments of the Septuagint that date from the first century BCE and the first century CE. This has led some scholars to acknowledge the possibility that Jesus and his disciples used the divine name when making these quotations. But we need to remember that Hebrew scripture quotations account for approximately one third of the 237 times the New World Translation restores the divine name in the Christian Greek scriptures. So what about the other two thirds of occurrences? Well, this brings us to the part of our program that involves some detective work. Imagine that you are a detective and you catch an art thief who has stolen over 200 original pieces of art from various museums and art galleries. This thief not only stole each piece of art, but he also substituted it with a copy. So you need to start an investigation and follow the clues. First of all, you need to find out where each painting was located originally. Once you have verified that fakes are hanging in those locations, you would be in a position to return the originals to their proper locations. In a similar way, we have solid evidence 
that a crime was committed in the second and third century CE. Apostate Christians removed the divine name from manuscripts of the Bible and replaced it with Kyrios, the Greek word for Lord. There is much evidence for this conclusion. So they are like the art thief in our illustration. They stole something valuable when they removed Jehovah's name from the Christian Greek scriptures. So the gist is that Watchtower is here justifying their putting uh, Jesus back into the, or what they say, back into the New Testament. There are, as I understand it, they said 237 instances in the New Testament where it's justified for them to put Jesus, uh, sorry, put Jehovah in there. <laughs> did I say Jesus? Um, what, did you, what did you make of all that? Uh, there's an interesting inference that, well, uh, as I understand it, they're drawing attention to the fact that I don't think anybody denies that there are copies of the Greek Septuagint Old Testament where they did not replace it with uh, Adonai, uh, or the, well, pretty much is Greek already, uh, the, the, uh, the Lord, uh, which, of course, Jewish, yeah, they, in Greek, kurios, it's the same sort of thing that, um, scribes or at least translators have done with the old testament when they have uh, the lord god or something like that they'll in where it had yahweh or the the tra tetragrammata the four letters uh in english y-h-w-h they they figured it was too holy to say you didn't know when you might be taking it in vain so let's just not say it and, and when we read it aloud let's say adonai lord uh well what the heck it's the name of god too and so we get that in english translations when it's all, when it's Lord in all caps or God in all caps, that's Yahweh, and uh, so they still do that uh, in in Christian translations. Um, and so in the uh, in the Septuagint, it's always been thought that they had Kurios, Lord, the equivalent of Adonai replacing uh, Yahweh. Well, they did in the copies we've always had, but some, it turns out, simply transliterated the four-letter name. Uh, and there were the equivalent Greek letters, no kurios. And so that it makes you suspect that scribes, copyists uh, of the Septuagint eventually started doing the same thing their Old Testament counterparts did and putting, uh, substituting kurios for for, for the tetragrammaton. Um, now, that I think is quite likely, but how you make the jump to the New Testament and assume that kurios uh, means uh, Jehovah or Yahweh, th there's a couple of big problems with this. I don't think there is any manuscript evidence, but of course there wouldn't be. This would have happened so early there'd be no manuscripts surviving. But uh, what would make you think such a systemic alteration had occurred? Uh, what what uh, contextual evidence is there for it? And I don't see that. Now, I have to admit, if I understand their argument right, it's possible some people understood that uh, Jesus was supposed to be using the divine name, especially since there are statements like, hallowed be thy name. Well, you know what name that is, hallowed, you know, let's protect it from abuse. Um, so it's conceivable that he would have used the, uh, the actual name, though unlikely, but on that basis, I did something similar in the pre-Nicene New Testament, uh, where, uh, I, where I think like in some Old Testament quotes and possibly in some statements ascribed to Jesus that he does mean to say, uh, when he says the Lord, he means Yahweh or Jehovah. But I admit that is speculative. And with the witness's view, Aren't they asking for trouble since Jesus is the one who is usually called Kurios? I mean, some, some New Testament references seem to be talking about the Old Testament God 
um, but uh, Jesus is certainly the kurios, Christos, the kurios, Jesus. What, how do they know that that is not supposed to be Jehovah? If it were, that would sort of torpedo their Christology. That's true. Yeah, it kind of brings the whole Trinitarian argument back in, doesn't it? But yeah, I, I guess um, what what fascinates me, and it's something when when you are a Jehovah's Witness, you just assume that the books of the, the Gospels were written more or less very soon after Jesus died. Immediately, they were being dispersed around the congregations. In this episode, they admit themselves that we don't have any uh, extant books from the first century. The earliest we get is from the middle of the second century. And wouldn't you know, that's also when they were all, when the uh, scribes were starting to apostatize and remove the name Jehovah from the New Testament. So, what reason is it to think they did? Yeah, there's a lot of supposition there, isn't yeah. there? So yeah, it's, it's very odd and um, I, I guess as well, it's, it's just refresh, refreshing to speak to someone who's a genuine Bible scholar, because another thing they do is that they repeatedly say, some scholars say this and some scholars say that, and they don't name any of them, <laughs> which mm -hmm. is very frustrating. If you're trying to make an argument, it's good mm -hmm. to say, these are the people who disagree with us. These are the people who agree with us. Do you think it's, do you think there's any justification for using uh, Yahweh anywhere in the New Testament? It's possible in a few places, and like I think they say, the absence of the article uh, may imply it, but it's uh, it's pretty iffy. Uh, I, I just uh, can't, uh, it's just speculation, really, uh, which doesn't rule it out, but I, I wouldn't go around saying, oh, yeah, we know this is true, when it's only a kind of a bare possibility. Mm -hmm. As F.C. Bauer said, anything is possible but the historian asks what is probable because otherwise you just believe in what you want to believe indeed well honestly it's great having your input on this and <laughs> um yeah I'd, I'd just be interested in knowing as a bible scholar what your general thoughts are on on jehovah's witnesses as a group i don't know whether you've heard much about sort of the child abuse scandals and or any of those sorts of things but what, what are your reflections on on Jehovah's Witnesses? Well I don't know much about the the uh, child uh, abuse things though of course uh, it's certainly not uh, improbable uh, given the epidemic of it in religious groups incredibly uh, but I've always gotten the impression that number one the members of the group really have to be admired for the the guts they have to do what they do. As a Baptist, I occasionally went door to door uh, evangelizing and so on. Uh, I know it it takes courage for them to do that, and, and I, uh, I admire them for it. But the, uh, the, the group itself, the hierarchy and all that, it seems pretty totalitarian to me. And uh, that just can't be right. I, I understand why they do it, because they're afraid of freedom, because freedom begets uncertainty and the fragmentation of opinion, uh, which is why the Catholic Church didn't like uh, the Reformation and the, the all-access approach to the Bible. Everybody's going to be his own pope, they said, uh, and that's just what happened. Uh, I don't think that's a bad thing, though, and when you do and you try to clamp down on everybody and their freedom of thought, you, that's abuse. Uh, you're, you're stunting people intellectually or you're using fear to control them. You're depicting God as a kind of a a peevish theology professor who's going to send you to hell or oblivion in this case, I guess, uh, um, if you get too many wrong on the final exam, it's, it just, this kind of thing stunts any kind of moral maturity, it seems to me, much less intellectual maturity. Forget about that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, you know, I, I think it's, uh, I don't have any fondness for them as a group, but it's not yeah. because of their theology. Uh, I, yeah. That's neither here nor there to me. 
Well, yeah, one, one distinction I try to draw on this channel is to distinguish between the, the group and the individual. So right as, as individuals, there are some beautiful people mm -hmm. in Jehovah's Witness religion. And I look back with fondness on many of them, hmm. even though they're now shunning me. Yeah, um, but no, but as, as a group, as you point out, there's a lot of uh, authoritarianism. Mm. And the argument, I well, I say argument, when I'm confronted by uh, Jehovah's Witnesses who visit my channel and don't like me being critical of the organization, I always say, well, it's either true or it's not true. Mm. If it's true, by all means, show me some evidence and I'll look mm. at it. Um, but if it's not true, you've got families breaking apart through shunning. Mm. You've got abuse being covered up on a huge scale and you've also got people dying by refusing blood so didn't uh, they uh, obviate that with the discovery of uh, that you could use artificial blood plasma for i don't i know nothing about medicine so in in 2000 they said you can will allow you to use what what they call fractions of blood so the four main components plasma platelets red blood cells and white blood cells are still off limits but if there's a part of one of those, let's say hemoglobin from the red blood cells, then you can use that, but you can't use any of the main components. And in a life, in a life or death situation, when there's huge loss of blood, um, sometimes it is the main components that people need and, and people will die if they don't get them. So pretty rough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right on the level with snake handling uh, yeah. with both of them i really admire the the courage but it seems like a futile battle to fight there were there are better things to die for indeed indeed well robert uh, dr price it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the john cedars channel your insights have been very interesting and sometimes surprising um, <laughs> I, i'll continue to follow your work with great interest and yeah thank you so much for joining me thanks for letting me be on so so viewers i hope you've enjoyed this interview please don't forget to subscribe for more videos and as always thank you for watching